The lockout continues, but we're here to entertain. We've got food ideas. We also are going to try to make the lockout as interesting as possible. That's why we've got Gabrielle Starr at GF Starr with us. The Baseball Insiders starts right now. All right, so Gabrielle, welcome. You uh, you look very summery. I understand it's 70 degrees in Boston today, the home of the Red Sox, which of course you are a diehard fan of. Welcome to the Baseball Insiders, by the way. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, it is it is our pleasure. Robert Murray, good to see you, buddy. You look fresh and ready. Do you have any news for us, Bert? What's going on? Will there be a deal this week? I've got my hammer out today. I'm going to hit it on the table. Will there be a deal this week? Are we going to have baseball on time? What do you know? Well, first off, I want to acknowledge that you shaved your beard. You're looking very fresh today, too, Carm. So I'm digging the look. I'm digging the look. Yeah, I, I had the grizzly thing going. Uh, unfortunately, at this advanced age, uh, the grays come flying in. I, I, I'm i still adjusting to that concept. So it does feel good to be on the baby space side. Thank you for noticing. Uh, by the way, I have been reading. I've been following all the uh, the movers and shakers of the world, you two and everyone else. And it seems like we are we are inching. We're inching towards a deal. Although we inch and then we pull away, that type of thing. There's a little dance going on, perhaps. Yeah, I think that's about right. It's basically ever since they've started meeting the last two days, there's been some progress, but also like some steps back. Like the fact they're meeting face to face for multiple hours in a day, like hopefully for every day this week, is a very good sign. But I would highly doubt we're going to end up having a deal done by the end of the week. And I will say this though, Carm, I'm going to give you some optimism here. Yeah. There's a lot of people that I'm talking to throughout baseball who are like increasingly optimistic that we have a deal done by at least next week. So maybe our lockout podcasts are almost reaching an end. At least I'm hoping so. Cause yeah. So, so and, and let me, Gabriel, I, I read your tweets and uh, you are very pro player of which I am as well, along with a million other things that you do out there. I love you on Twitter at GF star. If you're not following along, your life could be a lot better. Uh, but like, honestly, yeah, sure. Okay. I want players to make more money too, uh, because it's incredibly hard to get to their place in life. And I'd rather see uh, them have the dough than the billionaire owners who have the teams forever. I think that makes a lot of sense. But other than that, like, Honestly, do you care about any of this? Does anybody care about any of how this is going to shake out? Whether what money is going to be in the bonus pool and what the minimum salary is, if it's seven twenty-five, seven fifty, a million. Like, does anyone care? Because I clearly, I don't, I don't think fans care. Is is my just get it done, whatever the damn deal is, and let's play baseball. I mean, I think that the biggest thing is the players are there players are organizing their own spring training workouts if you look at the miami marlins they were like well we're not allowed at the marlins facility we're just gonna go to a random field and have our own spring training and the biggest thing is i think what fans seem to ignore is that not everyone's making what max scherzer's making the majority of players are making far less. And when people want to talk about the average MLB salary, you have to remember that the salaries of people like Scherzer, Trout, Harper, Machado totally skew that average because there are far, far more players at the lower end of that spectrum. Yes, as normal people, it sounds like a ton of money. You know, the current minimum is 575 or something. You take out your taxes, your agent fees, you pay a ton of taxes as a player. And yes, it's still a lot of money, but for what they're doing in the context of the rising revenue of Major League Baseball, it's absurd that the people who cause those ri rising revenues by their on-field work are not getting more money as everybody else is. Basically, everyone's profiting off of them more except for themselves. And that's wrong. Yeah, uh, I'm with you. Listen, they're, they, I don't pay to look to see an owner in his box uh and then we're gonna have some food on the podcast today you know eat his uh whatever new upper level product is at your baseball stadium the sushi in the box type of thing I, I pay to see the guys on the field just like i don't pay to see the umpires and all that type of stuff um but i think it also comes crashing in like the average person doesn't make six hundred and fifteen thousand dollars um and so despite the fact that it's uh, very hard to get to where they've gotten to. 
And uh, so many baseball players, they, they work their whole lives to get there and they last for two years and you know, whatever, a million dollars is a ton of dough, but it's not for a lifetime. Uh, when you consider everything that you mentioned, Gabrielle, with the taxes and everything, and they got to pay tax. If I may, if I play the Colorado Rockies in Colorado, I got to pay, I got to pay taxes in Colorado that day. I don't know how this all the, you know, how they even keep the whole thing straight. But I don't know, Bernie, right, you feel complicated. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I just don't know, like for fans out there right now, it's just like, come on, man. Uh, it, it does fall into millionaires arguing with billionaires. I think that's I think that's a lot of how the fans are looking at this. Like, just wake me up when it's over, basically. No, exactly. And like, and I know you and I, Carm, like, sorry, I, I got to get into this real quick. Yeah. Is I know you and I have debated this extensively throughout the the lockout here is whether or not fans are actually serious about their threats to leave and like not watch major league baseball again. So Gabrielle, I'm curious, yeah, okay. like you follow that. Like I, maybe I just repeated what Carm said, but like, I, I'm very curious, like what, where do you stand on that? She's going to be, you're going to be at, at Fenway park on May the whatever, when this thing is over. Right. Am I, am I wrong? Carm, I was at Fenway park this morning, just walking with my coffee, just to feel something in my cold, dead heart. What are you talking about? I'm at Fenway park all the time. I had a right. TikTok this morning at Fenway park. Like it's, I need it. I don't, I can't live without it. I actually saw a tweet yesterday. Someone was like, if someone offered you $20 million, but you could never watch an NFL game again, like, would you do it? And I was like, yeah, easily. If someone offered me $20 million to like, never watch a Red Sox game again, my bank account balance would stay the same. Let's just put it that way. Wow. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold, hold up. Hold up. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Follow yeah. Up. What's the number that gets you to like, stop watching the Red Sox? ownership of the Red Sox. Cause I would venture a guess that I watch more games than they do. So you're, you're basically saying that there's no money, no money to you. That would be worth it in your life to take away the enjoyment of baseball. You love baseball <laughs> more than endless dough. I can hear, I mean, like that's look, an, we all work in sports. So clearly money is not our main priority. Right. Life. I mean, I can't argue with that. That's true. I mean, Bert, 20 million, you never get to watch baseball again. You in? You have to find other interests in your life. That's a, that's a very, that could be the headline for this podcast. He can just you, start doing terrible food takes for everybody instead. Right. It's fine. Honestly, right. that business is flying. It's, it's basically up there with sports gambling. So I would have that market <laughs> cornered, but boy, uh, I got to think about that. 20 million bucks to stop watching baseball. I mean, I think it's a question for like anyone listening, like 20 million to stop doing your favorite thing. Uh, and for, you know, a lot of people, sports is super casual and the world series on the Super Bowl's on, I'm going to watch. And then there's your diehards who are walking around at Fenway park and are doing a TikTok today. And just, you know, you, you will forever remember the first time you ever walked into your favorite baseball stadium and seeing the green grass or the green monster or the Ivy or, uh, the retractable roof in Miller park. I don't know what, whatever it is, you know, that that's like a moment in your life. It's got family connected to it it's got your childhood it's there's an innocence even though we're talking about millions and billions but there's something about the game that's you know we all we all want some purity in our life if I if I may go deep here for a second on the baseball insiders I, I think that's what baseball represents to a lot of people no I think you're right and like I'm, I'm continuing to think about this Carm 20 million bucks I think I I, I think I would do it although I think oh, I would run out of you. money um, just because I was telling Gabrielle, so bananas. I'm, uh, I'm trying to add weight and I don't even know if 20 million bucks would cover my food for the rest of my yeah. life. Cause I I'm eating six meals a day. Why are you any minor leaguer weight? who, any minor leaguer who's listening to this is just hating you right now, Bert. I mean, most people do hate me for my food takes, so it's nothing out of the norm here. Um, but I'm trying to add some muscle car. We're trying to get uh, bulked up bird over here. Uh, okay. He's trying okay. to get in the best shape of his life. Cause it's spring training or it should be. You know? okay. oh, yeah, that's true. Should All be. Right. Well, should here, be. Let, let, let's get to your food then in one second. I just want to get a full recap from you guys as to what we know, uh, is the current state of baseball. Nope. Of course, that'll change by the time that many people will, will listen to this podcast, but as of today, which is February the 23rd, recording on a Wednesday, we got the Mets, Max Scherzer. We got the Cardinals, Paul Goldschmidt. We got the Cubs, Ian Happ. Uh, they are among the players who are meeting with Rockies owner Dick Monfort and Padres owner Ron Fowler. Uh, 
One of the big sticking points is that only 22% of players are arbitration eligible after two years of service time. Uh, the union wants 80%, but they've gone down to 75%. The owners want to keep it the same. So basically saying like, hey, after two years in the league, if I, um, I want to be able to get paid closer to what I'm worth, uh, baseball trying to hold the line on that. We touched on the minimum salaries, which uh, from what I'm reading should be basically considering the, the wages in baseball uh, around a million uh, for, for the bare minimum of making it, which is an amazing number. Like, Hey, if you make it to baseball, you make a million dollars, which is like, that just sounds really cool. Right. Um, but it's, as Gabrielle mentioned, it's at, at five seventy five. it's been uh, yeah. boosted up into the sixes. I think, Right now, the the players want something like seven seventy five and an increase of thirty thousand a year for five years. So that's one fifty that takes you to nine and a quarter, which is a livable wage. Um, and it's you know, and then they've got the 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 thing that's interesting to me is the tanking. The players are like screw tanking, which means you don't want to pay us. You have an out, and now they want a draft lottery which Major League Baseball said, okay, we'll have a three-team draft lottery. The players like, that's not enough. We want eight. Major League Baseball came up to four. The players went down to seven. This is not a hard negotiation. You go up to five. We go to six. You know, that, that's you know that's how this is going to work, right? Um, but I, I don't know. Am I missing any issues here that I just laid out? Or, or, or do you have any update? Do either of you have any I concept mean, of what the hell's going on here is, or when this is going to get done? I'm asking the same question again. You also have the service time manipulation, you know, and you, that speaks to the major league minimum, because the thing is that even if you do make it to the majors, you know, pay players at the like, kind of lower end of the, I wouldn't say skill set, but like players who get called up from AAA, a lot of times they're sh shuffled back and forth. They're getting sent back up and down from AAA. There's the service time manip manipulation, you know, have someone like Wander Franco with the Tampa Bay Rays, like the, he was ready to debut. They didn't, he they didn't call him up right away. You have, it's not just about the fact that major leaguers want an increased major league minimum. It's about the fact that it's not like once you make your debut, you're up there and you're getting that full minimum. Like there are players who go up and down. And so they make the major league salary for the days that they're there, then they get sent back. And, you know, it's not, it's not like a full, like once you're a major leaguer, for two days, you know, you're good to go and you're staying up there. Players want to be screwed around less. If you're ready to debut and your team has space for you, then they should bring you up and you should be a major leaguer. You shouldn't just be getting screwed over because a team doesn't want to pay you money that they wouldn't even miss from their bank account. Yeah. Something I'm actually really curious about and a story that I've wanted to do for some time is asking players who have like ridden that roller coaster from the majors to triple A back and forth and just continue to do it throughout the entire season. Like what's that like mentally and also financially? Um, you should talk I, to Tanner Houck from the Red Sox. And uh, also I remember Kyle Garlick with the Dodgers a couple of years ago. I think I remember him being up with the Dodgers for like two or three days. And within those few days, he made more money than he was going to make for his entire minor league season. You know, he made like, thousands and thousands of dollars just being there it changes their lives and obviously the minor league conversation is a very different enormous animal but that just speaks to how much the money is being manipulated and when you remember that the people manipulating the money are literal billionaires there's a very icky taste in your mouth just at the whole issue no i couldn't agree with you more and like obviously there's a lot of talk now that major league baseball especially with their most recent offers they don't care about the minor league players but if we want to end up like backtracking to what Carm was saying before um, about how we can end up getting some progress in these talks i feel like one of the biggest concessions that the players can make is with that draft lottery um and bringing that down and meeting the owners at a number that's closer to what they want and then the players end up getting something more in their favor um, I think that's one of many concessions that are going to end up having to be made. I still firmly believe that this next CBA is going to be player friendly, but that one really stands out. So speaking, the, yeah, oh, go ahead, Garbio. Sorry, Mark. I was just going to bring up, you know, the, the CBT negotiations that have kind of been a huge sticking point and haven't even really been fully negotiated from what I've heard at this point. Another big thing that plays into this, you take a team like the Phillies, for example, they're never good, but their payroll is super high. 
Right now, they have about $30 million in space under the luxury tax threshold. And the problem is that right under the last CBA, the a player's contracts, you know, average annual value is what would count towards the CBA. So no matter if a player is making 5 million, 10 million, 1 million, if they have a three year, $60 million deal, 20 million of that counts towards the luxury tax threshold. So for a team like the Phillies that has never gone over the luxury tax threshold and doesn't seem to intend to, they're not, they might not sign a player like Kyle Schwarber. That's the, that's the deal that he wants three years, 60 million, because all of a sudden they only have 10 million in space left under that threshold even if they actually are paying him $5 million a year over, you know, X amount of years. And that's, that's another issue because it plays into teams, not building competitively if they aren't going to go over that threshold. Well, and that's the biggest uh, owner versus owner battle, right? Like we want the luxury tax to be lower. So uh, like the, the small market teams do. So we get money from you. Whereas the big market teams want it to be high. Uh, the players want it to be high. So there will be uh, less, less restrictions on salaries for, you know, the Yankees, the Red Sox, the Cubs, whoever uh, to pay players, what players believe that they're worth, what, what a free market would actually dictate. Um I, the, the, what's, what's in, what's most interesting to me about uh, just could sort of bringing this conversation together, like the minor league portion, like if you go to a minor league game, chances are there's going to be a decent crowd out there. People are going to be drinking beer. They're eating hot dogs. The mascots doing something. There's somebody spinning around on a bat. It's, it's affordable for a family and baseball is just getting rid of this. It's also aside from the the depth of the minor league and all the levels. See what what baseball has done is like, well, we could look at the radar gun and see that you are throwing 98, so you're gonna make it. And that dude over there, uh, I'll just pick out a, a Cub player, Kyle Hendricks, who's throwing 88. You're not gonna make it. Whereas it's not actually based on well this dude competing on this level is successful here. Let's see if he, how he does on the next level and the next level. And he's actually playing the game and not playing a computer game. They're taking that away. So in essence, dudes who actually are good enough to play in the big leagues, aren't going to get there. So, which just sucks. Like you, you're, we're, we're doing this by like looking at a computer versus like what's happening on the field by shrinking the minor leagues to save some money that they absolutely have. Gabrielle, I know you, you're, you're putting in the chat that you got a ton to say on this. So I want, I want to hear your follow-up but it's just like like fans love the minor leagues it's great for the players it doesn't cost that much we're not talking it it seems ridiculous to me that you know you're 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 squeezing out like a a, like a, a very big fabric of the game that's good in a lot of places the minor leagues the treatment of the minor leagues is basically like if you were trying to grow a fruit tree and just decided to hack away at the root of the tree Minor leaguers are the lifeblood of major league baseball. And the fact that they aren't nurtured paid bare minimum above the poverty line, which is about $13,000 in the United States right now. Most minor leaguers are broke or they're working a billion jobs just to get by. You had that story about Randy Dubnak from the Minnesota twins during the playoff game against the Yankees. A few years ago, Yankees fans were mocking him for driving like Uber or Lyft to make money during the minor league season before he got called up. I covered triple a woo Sox in Worcester this year. And some of those games were outselling Tampa Bay Rays games. Right. Right. Oh, and their ballpark capacity is 10,000 seats. And they were over, they were outdoing the number one first place team in the American league East. The food is amazing. People love it. It's affordable. I took my dad to a game at the end of the season and I bought two of the best seats in the ballpark. And that total was $80. It was $40 a ticket for the best seats in the ballpark. You can't even get a bleacher seat at Fenway Park for $40. It's it's just different. But the thing is, a lot of places don't have a major league ballpark. A lot of people can't afford a major league ballpark, which is a different issue in itself. But they can afford minor league games. And you get to see people who are trying to live out their dream. There's something really special and intimate about the minor leagues. There's also something really dark and dirty underlying the whole thing, because you know that these are people who are struggling 
And my personal opinion is that your employer shouldn't be making it harder for you to do your job. Your employer should be making it the best possible workplace environment for you to do your job. No. And I, so this is me because I have not bought a ticket in quite a while. Um, yeah, much, I, like I usually don't ticket, either. Like how much does an actual ticket cost? Like a good one. You talking I about mean, to a major it var- league or, or a major, major league game? Like, cause I heard her say 40, 40 bucks for like a good ticket for a minor league game. So I'm curious what it is for like, a major- you can get like a $15 ticket to a, a Woo Sox triple a game. Yeah. Fenway park. I would say, I mean, Fenway varies and it's also one of the more expensive ballparks, but typically uh, if I'm going to a game as a fan, I'm going I'm, I'm going to buy a bit of a nicer ticket and usually spend between 80 and a hundred dollars, um, yeah. before fees. And then of course, you know, there's like a beer for like $15 and a $20 lobster roll. I don't eat those, but the, I'm just pointing out like <laughs> the pricing, the pricing is absurd. It's like $6 for a water bottle. Parking's $50. Well, ba- baseball at the end of the day though, is still like by far the most affordable of all the sports. Um, like and a great seat or a really good seat for a Red Sox game is, is going to be super expensive. And even an upper, uh, probably up, up top is, I don't know, 30, 40 bucks, something like that. I, I would guess maybe even 50. Uh, and, and, and also you're talking about different days of the week that baseball, the secondary market has killed the fan because baseball and any sport, they know exactly what their ticket is worth. That ticket in that section on that, days normally sells for this much so we're gonna we're gonna charge xyz so fans are just paying more but they also know that like there's for the te- the teams that don't sell that ticket in the upper deck is gonna be is they'll they'll let you in for five bucks because you know that they know that you're not paying for it and they'll hope to get as much uh from concessions and everything else from you and they know that's a win just to have you in the park so like i mean white Sox games on the sunday five dollar tickets that's on Sundays or whatever in the upper deck. Cause they know they're not selling the seat, but hopefully you'll buy a $10 beer and that's a win for the socks. But what's your point here, Bert? Why, what, what are we going on ticket prices? No, like I, I was, I was just genuinely curious. Cause like, I didn't, yeah. I didn't know. Like, yeah, that's just, I, yeah. I mean, in LA, when I lived there a couple of years ago, I could go to an angels game upper deck for like 18 bucks. And those games were so empty that I would end up going down and sitting like on the first baseline, maybe 15 rows back in a seat that I would not spend the money on if it was like at Fenway. So there are obviously ballparks that are more affordable. I know last season, the Baltimore Orioles were doing a ticket pack where it was like, you could go to every August game for a total of $40. But that right. also speaks to the competitive, like the competitive, you know, the lack of com- competition between a lot of teams. You know, if a team knows that they're not going to be good this year, which like should just never be the case, you know, you shouldn't know that your season's over before it even begins. And that's basically been the Orioles for four years. And they're selling, you know, $40. You can go to every game. $40 gets you maybe the worst seat in the house at Fenway on any given night. It's just a very, very large gap that needs to be closed. But, but look, like, I guess what I'm trying to underline is the, the one thing about baseball, like to get an NFL ticket in the, in the last row of the upper deck, that's probably a hundred dollars in most stadiums, it's just the way it is. There's, you know, eight and or nine regular season games and fans will, or will pay enormous amounts of money to do it. Uh, NBA tickets are, are more expensive. So, same thing with the NHL. So there's, there's something that baseball has here, which is part of the reason that revenues are so high, which, which like getting back to where we started the conversation, it makes it so frustrating because there, there's so much money in the game that you would think that these two sides would be more partners like the NBA, the owners and their, and the players, they're much more in it together. It's much more of a group that is actually like trust each other. Baseball, there's no trust. It's uh, on either well, side. Well, you know, you lock out the players. They're probably not going to want to trust you because you lock them out. So it's, I mean, I will right. also say, you know, you have 162 regular season games in Major League Baseball versus, you know, less than 20 regular season right. games in the NFL. A normal family in this country can't go to more than a couple if even at all games in the expensive big market cities, that's why you see so many empty seats at a lot of the biggest ballparks, because most people can't afford to go there. And the problem is that MLB is kind of inflating itself because right now you have people who pay for cable. So cable is giving you those absurd ticket 
uh, not ticket, sorry, those absurd contracts, you know, every MLB team, I think got like a hundred million dollars last month for their TV deals. The problem is people my age don't pay for cable. And if I pay for MLB TV, I'm blacked out when my team is anywhere near me. So you are creating an impossible situation where people can't go, can't afford to go to the ballpark, but also can't watch your games unless they pay for cable. And you're also locking out your players. So for the second time in three years, you are delaying your season and creating a fractured relationship. And the whole thing combined just makes it a very unwelcoming environment that you don't see in other leagues. And it's bad for the game as a whole. Well, that's the bigger issue for baseball too. When you look long-term, the average baseball fan uh, is old. Uh, I think the average comes out to, I think 57 years old. Yeah. So, so if you are going to splinter the market further and charge 20 bucks a month, whatever, to watch your team, how many young people are, are actually going to do that? Um, and then if they don't, then does baseball get forgotten? And does it look a whole lot different, you know, 10, 15, 20 years out? And it's not the game that everybody grew up with, at least in my era, coming home from school, you had channel nine and, and that was, a, that was the superstation. The Cubs were on and, and that's whether you're a Cub fan or not, people watched it. Cause it was the one game that was on nowadays, you know, it's just, it's just, it's totally different, which is part of what, you know, the, the what's the risk of a lockout for uh, baseball right now. And, you know, we, I was saying that, you know, if you're a fan, you're a fan, you're a fan, but, um, and that, and that's true. I believe that, but there's also like risk reward here missing a couple of months of the season and having a lot of bad press around your sport. That's, that's not exactly uh, a great idea, especially when the deal that you're going to sign probably in two months is probably the same deal that you could sign tomorrow. If you just sit there and, and, you know, we're not leaving. There's no boats. There's no one's leaving this Island until it's done. And we're going, and we're going to spring training tomorrow, like make the best deal and let's go forward. And we can, you know, there's, you guys have a finite time. You can play the game and we want to make a deal on this side. So let's get her done. I don't know. Look, uh, am I missing any update bird from all your insiders over there that uh, outside of the fact that you think that there could be a deal next week? I think you hit the nail on the head with basically with what you said. I like, I know what you're saying about like being, we're being frustrated about a deal not getting done in the last couple of months. Um, but there's been no real urgency because there's been no deadline and there's been no games that have been at risk of being missed. That's at least how major league baseball is viewing this. The players have wanted to meet for a while um, and they've been frustrated by the lack of urgency from MLB, but I'm a big believer. And I know Andrew Brandt has said this on Twitter a lot, that deadlines spur action. That's something I believe too, that 20, that February 28th deadline, that's got all these sides feeling the pressure now. Um, I, I still don't, th- like, as I told you, I don't think we're going to have a deal done by the 28th, but like March 3rd, March 4th in that range, maybe okay. that's when we're like starting to look at the deal getting pretty close there. Just a guess. That's what a lot of industry people think at least. Yeah. I mean, one of those industry people, Evan Drylick, who does a great job over the athletic, he's, he, I saw his, one of his pieces today saying that there a way, a pathway to 162 game season. If it starts late is that we could have the same seven inning double headers um, that we've been seeing in the pandemic to get to 162, which by the way, is the ultimate screwing of the fan. When you, when you are, because n- nowadays they, that, 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 that's where fans really should. That's where I get angry. Like, Hey, I paid for a nine inning game. Now I'm getting seven. Now we have a double header and you're, you're not making it a straight double header. You're making it a split double header. So you're making me pay full price for a seven inning game. If it's the day game, you're kicking me out, uh, which is irritating as hell. And what you're also doing a lot of times that day game is from the is from a rain out from uh, a week ago. So now my ticket that I bought for a night game on a Wednesday is now a day game on a Tuesday. I got to miss work to go see less baseball and pay the price that I paid for your sorry ass. When that, when that game at one o'clock in the afternoon is worth $3 on the secondary market and you know, it's worth that. So you're like willingly screwing the fan. 
Uh, that sucks. And that's, and that's what, if I was baseball, um, I, I, I would not, I would look long-term on that stuff. And constantly they're just trying to squeeze everything they possibly can from the fan reactions, please. Ugh, I want to scream. I hate it so much for the last few years. I feel like the rising revenue has just made MLB so bold about how little they have to care about their fans. Every possible thing that they could do to grow the game, to show fan appreciation, they do not do it. Even the things that would actually make them more money. You have these ballparks that are never full, like Oakland, do $5 tickets for kids. You will still make $5 where you weren't making $5 plus now they're in your ballpark and they will buy food and drinks. They will make, you will make a fan for life because most baseball fans are people who went as kids and they live on the nostalgia and that's why they still show up. That's why I'm here. That's why Bert's here. Like I love baseball because my dad and mom took me to Fenway park as a kid. And my grandfather took my dad as a kid and my 103 year old uncle bless his heart is still a Red Sox fan. And he was born in June of 1918 and waited 86 years to see a freaking world series. Baseball could be marketing to families with kids and instead they're pricing them out and blacking them out. You could have games that were earlier. Instead, you have games at 7 or 8 p.m. when kids are going to bed. There is just so much that they could be doing that would actually be beneficial for both sides of the situation. And instead, they're like, oh, why does no one want to come to our games? Why is the Oakland Coliseum empty? Why does nobody come to the TROP? Um, maybe because nobody wants to pay $30 to bring their kid to a game for two innings before bedtime and then leave. Well, it's and, all and, very unproductive. And they could also take a, a hint from the Atlanta Falcons of the NFL. And here we can get into your food takes here, Bert. Concession prices should be reasonable, or at least there should be reasonable items on there. If you want to charge a lot for beer uh, and, and maybe you have one beer night a week, I, 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 would, I would do something like that. But a hot dog should not be $7. It shouldn't be 6 bucks. It should be 2 bucks. Let a uh, let let somebody into the park and have them. You're still making money on a two dollar hot dog, by the way. Um, you know, nachos three dollars. Like, just make hey, dude, let's let's go to the game. Like, dude, the two dogs are two bucks. It'll be great. You know, so I don't a little incentive of going to the park versus like if I'm going to be there for three hours, four hours in a, in a normal baseball game nowadays with the strike zone the size of a teacup and everything else that goes on instant replay. At least let me uh, be able to you know, eat and or drink at a reasonable rate. It's also would be good marketing for the game. Um, all right. You guys wanted to talk food. Your number one, whenever this lockout ends, the number one food product you want to eat at a baseball game, Gabrielle's probably going to go something healthy. I feel like um, that's, that's new age, Bert. What, what's your, what's your first, what's your take? I got, I got plenty of options here, Carl. So get ready. So for nostalgia, I got to go with a hot dog just cause like, I mean, having a hot dog at a ball game is like, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> and we're going to go like off the, off of a lesser path here. I mean, I guess chicken tenders, cause they can't really go on a lesser path, but, 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 but hang on. I, I don't like that look of judgment card. It's, like, it's a chicken tenders. What is this? A chilies? Like that? This hey, I mean, chilies is good. It's serviceable. I mean, it's not like I wouldn't go out of my way. I'm not, I'm not knocking chilies, but we're not at, we're not at chilies. We're, but go ahead, go ahead. Keep going. Chicken right. tenders. <laughs> but I will say my all time favorite food item that I've had at a ball game was at the world series in Atlanta. I had sushi. And having sushi while watching baseball was so freaking sweet. It's like my favorite food, my favorite sport combined into one. Like that's, I was about how to say you, something that was not fit for the airwaves, but. Um, how do you get to sushi from chicken tenders? Like I, I, and, and. Trying to class sushi this at Yankee up. stadium too. Are you sitting there yeah. with chopsticks and soy sauce and uh, wasabi there, Bert, how are you doing your sushi? So actually a fun food story for you. So wasabi, I love wasabi, big wasabi guy. Um, okay. Okay. And the first time I ever went was, with your finger or with the chopsticks, how are you putting the wasabi on there? Cause I'm a big finger with wasabi guy, which is nasty. Right in the so, eyeball. Yeah. Right, oh. right, that's the problem. How yeah, do you, how do you do it, Bert? Explain your, well, I, your process. I, I do it with a fork um, because I'm a peasant. <laughs> I can't figure out how to use chopsticks. Um, but so the first time I ever had sushi was with Fabian Ardaya in Arizona here a couple of years ago. 
Um, and I thought it was avocado. Um, oh, spoiler go. alert, wasabi is very hot and very spicy. Um, and I'm not kidding. I was crying at the table there with his mom and with Fabian and his sister. Um, and I look like a complete idiot. It was the first time I ever met them. Um, but wasabi is delicious when you actually mix it with the sushi. So, but yeah, I will say Bert, I sent, I sent Bert a picture of my poke bowl yesterday because I, there's a new poke place near me. I'm not kidding. I ordered it twice yesterday. I ordered the same thing a second time for dinner and I sent Bert a picture. True. I thought, cause it had avocado in it but it also had wasabi in it. And at one point I thought I had taken a piece oh. of avocado, but it was actually a giant chunk of wasabi. So my sinuses are really clear, but I also there think my go. taste buds are, are mildly traumatized. Um, Fenway, I hate to say the food selection is not great. They actually used to have a great veggie burger. And then after the 2017 season, they got rid of it. So they actually went backwards in terms of food accessibility. And as a kosher vegetarian, I'm kind of like, <laughs> my options are very limited because there's just not a lot for me to eat. Um, I will say though, they, you know, my parents are kosher and, um, it's kind of like a weird, like isolating thing when you're a kid and you want the classic ballpark experience, but like the hot dogs aren't kosher. So there's actually now a kosher vending machine at Fenway, like one of those hot food vending machines and it makes kosher hot dogs. Um, but at AAA Worcester, they have an incredible food selection, like better than Fenway low key. They have the nachos in the helmet, but it's like, it's like legit nachos, like these elote street corn nachos in a woo socks helmet. And, um, they have a kosher hot food stand. I told my dad about it and he came to a woo socks game and had shawarma from the kosher hot food stand. They have like kosher hot dogs, like brisket, all of these things, like Jewish people all over the world are like, this is the only ballpark that I can come to, to get like a classic Jewish kosher hot meal. Nowhere is, else. Is your dad a professor? He, he literally just picked up 8,000. He's a books. rabbi. He's a, okay. He's a rabbi. Okay. And this okay. is one of his many book corners. I'm okay. actually using uh, his microphone right now. I mean, he looks the like, guy. Well, I mean, this man is a professional. Uh, so, okay. This, this, this is the awkward transition into Jewish food at a ballpark, Bert, because we were- Hang on, I, I, I got it. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so her idea, her mentioning nachos reminded me of tachos. Um, big tacho guy, love tachos. Um, What's tachos? I have no idea what this is, but it like sounds like something tots, I would eat. <gasps> but with nachos. Um, you have my attention. I get them without cheese because I'm anti-dairy. Um, so yeah. Okay. I do. I try to avoid dairy too. So I, hey, I I'm not the only one on this podcast, so I'm feeling better about myself, but another one and the best or actually the second best food item I've ever had at a ballpark was formerly known as AT&T park, the garlic fries. I inhale those things. Like, I'm not kidding you. If like I could find a job just eating garlic fries for a living, I would, I would do it. I might end up gaining a lot of weight, but like, I mean, it's garlic fries. I'd do it. I had the garlic fries at the Mariners park this summer and they were quite good, but I will say the Fenway fancy seats. I used to have a friend that worked for the company that does the food for Fenway. And so he would low key, just make me the rich people food that only you only get in like the first three rows of the ballpark in certain areas that like a waiter brings to you. And it was like this gorgeous veggie burger with like an avocado mash and like sprouts and like a special aioli on like a really fancy bun, something that Fenway would charge like $50 for if they were serving it to like the normal people. And he would just bring one to my seats with like the nice fries. And I've never, never enjoyed anything more. It was so bougie, but it was like such a nice treat. And then he stopped working there. So no, I, now I just eat like Cracker Jacks. <laughs> so I, I do, I got to bring this full circle here. I, Number one, I, I'm still having a hard time with all the good ballpark food. Like in Chicago, uh, South Side, White Sox, they do a phenomenal job. Phenomenal. And there's plenty of kosher hot dogs and they're grilled and, and, and it's awesome. And it's amazing. Um, and everything else. But if I could go back in time, ballpark food should be very simple. Hot dog, peanuts, nacho, beer, malt cup, like 
that's cotton candy. Like so the you nacho- don't want to pay thirty dollars for the Fenway lobster. Roll? I don't. Right, exactly. I do, and I want the nachos <laughs> to be a good chip with the bad cheese and the jalapeno, and that's it. I don't need like there should be no pico de gallo. There should be no like any fancy things that go in nachos. To, like even though it's delicious and I get it, but like you're not at a restaurant. You're at the ballpark. Like the 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 bathroom should smell like a bathroom. It shouldn't be clean. It should be nasty. That's you're at you're in a stadium. Like know where you're at. There should be a trough and no in, for for men. Uh, clearly, that's how that's how it is. The, it's the most efficient thing going. You walk in, you stand next to the other dude. It all flows the same way. And then you're out of there and it smells. That's, that's, no, that never is felt stadium. more like a woman in sports than this very moment. Right that now. is stadium. <laughs> that's stadium life. Why can't like, mm-hmm. I'm not, I think Fenway still has the trough. I, I wouldn't know firsthand, obviously, but I'm those bathrooms are like 110 years old. So I right trough. You okay. can get the bathroom experience at Fenway park. It is, quite gross i mean when they rehabbed wrigley there was a big fight like listen you guys can put in some toilets but you better leave the troughs alone so it's like it's like half trough half toilet for because <laughs> there's not a lot of not space to, in there let's no. go not chop, to get chop. off topic but kind of on this topic because i went to the gym the other day and it was really nice the gym was like almost completely empty so i go on a treadmill and i literally have a row of like 10 treadmills all to myself right and some old guy comes over and like has to choose the treadmill right next to me. It's creepy. And I tweeted about it. And the most frequent was response was guys being like, it's like if somebody chose the urinal right next to you when there were seven open urinals. So I guess now I know what it feels like to be a guy. Yeah, that is actually, a, 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 I mean, it's a little bit different, but that is a thing, dude. You see that one over there? Like wh- wh- why are we budding we up? Have here? We have to stand we- next to me. Like, come empty on. parking lot you have to park next to my car right, i think you're right. gonna murder me right right exactly you you very well if somebody does that you very well could be a murderer yes bird what do you got over there no because like i mean it, well i'm gonna start off with bathroom etiquette here so let's say you're you're, you're a dude here um well I, carm you are a dude um thank you <laughs> and i'm an uh, honorary dude yeah you're you're a dude i decide oh. i decided i'm an honorary dude i there work in go. sports that's that's dude enough there's well <laughs> I'm fascinated where Bert's about to go with this. Go ahead. So, like bathroom etiquette, you got like, so you see a guy. Let's he's in the middle of the of the urinal section there by himself. You can't go next to him. You have to go as far away as you possibly can because they just you have to go as urinal. far away, just not right next to him in my mind. But go keep going. And like, and going back to what you were saying about Wrigley Field and the troughs, I yeah, I, I need to share this experience with you that I had my first time ever, I walked into those bathrooms and I saw the troughs and I thought everybody was peeing in a sink. Um, it was just, it was very, very strange. And I remember going up and I had the worst stage fright I've ever had in my life. And I could not go Couldn't this get was it before done? The game. And I was drinking waters off the wazoo because it was just, it was absolutely toasty that day. Um, There's three stalls in the back corner for those who are shy. You should have gone there. Yeah, well, the lines were like, what seemed were like fifty people deep. At least it what it seemed. Um, but I, I held it in for all nine innings of that game. I was, oh my god, I was clenching it. Um, it was bad. Um, That's a painful experience, right there, Bert. It was, and like I'll tell you, like going up in the press box like, as a credentialed media member, and then going into that bathroom was so nice. Actually, first time I ever peed at Wrigley as a media member. I had a rod next to me, so I, I got that memory. Well, First time that, I ever peed at a ballpark was spring training and Manny Machado's wife was in the stall next to me. Well, this is huge. One, one of my first memorable pee moments in the press box. I don't know. It wasn't my first moment, but it was, it was, it was me and Harry Carey. And no, uh, actually, yes, yes, there's all right. Mark wins. Let's pack it up. There was, there was (laughs) two, there was two, uh, stand up urinals in there. One sit down in a very tight quarter. And so, and Harry walks in, I'm sitting there. I'm like, you know, this is 1997. This is the year that I think the year he passed, I'm just starting out and, um, you know, it's Harry Carey. So I said to him, you know, what's up, Harry, how are you doing? My, my man, like, you know, Oh, and he just, oh, 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 hang on, I'll let you go. Keep going. Sorry. You got to talk to him at that point. Like it's Harry Carey. 
and he just and which is very odd but there was there was a dividing thing um so i i said what's you know how are you harry ah oh, the ball club and he just because <laughs> the cubs started 0 and 14 that year managed by jim riggleman and so harry and i had a had a uh had a little quick combo now i'll turn it around my friend i let's 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 get it going and uh that was it that was my moment with harry uh Gabrielle, you had one more thing on food. I think I saw. Oh, I did. Um, my, I agree with you on like classic. I'm a classics girl. So I agree on classic ballpark food. Like if you're offering me a salad at a ballpark, like Fenway park sells salads. Am I ever going to buy one of those salads and sit at Fenway and eat a salad? No, that's like the least ballparky food I've, I could possibly think about, right. but I will say I would love grilled cheese at a ballpark because I feel like Grilled cheese is the vegetarian version of like a hot dog. You know, it's a classic American food that's easy to make, not super expensive, delicious and simple. And that's the kind of food that should be at a ballpark. And if you can't eat a hot dog like me, grilled cheese, perfect problem solved. I think that's a tremendous idea. And we should promote this part of the podcast. Grilled cheese should be a staple. And uh, we also talked I would about pay by, good money for a grilled cheese. At the well, it, 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 you see, by, 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 I'm, I'm, no, 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 we're not gonna pay good money for it. Don't, don't say that again. Oh, we're, no, we're, gonna, no. we're gonna pay what a grilled cheese is worth, which is two bucks. Um, that's what it should be. It, it should be like the master. I don't think anything at Fenway costs two bucks. I know. I don't think any, that, literally anything. And that, and that's just, just, that's just a shame. We're getting, I'm getting the two dollar grilled cheese. Um, you're gonna have to have it on white. Uh, but maybe we can, we maybe we can get a little. Uh, yeah, I don't know, uh, a wheat uh, slash multigrain slash sourdough situation here. That makes it more complicated. But to me, like a grilled cheese is a grilled cheese, white bread, butter, American cheese, done. Let's go. This is not, we're not, we're not at a, we're not at a restaurant, Bert. This is a ballpark grilled cheese and it's delicious. Bert just wants banana stands at every, at every ballpark because if you yeah. just go around monkey see monkey do getting bananas at every ballpark. Yeah. Well, maybe have a peanut butter stand too, to like switch it up a bit. And then my life is very good. But with grilled cheese, there's, butter don't eat cheese that i don't eat I you do bread. mayo not butter come on mayo does it better nah, mayo. Or in my case vegan no vegan i do vegan mayo so it's not you disgusting cook a grilled cheese with vegan mayo on the outside of the grilled cheese the vegan mayo is what makes it so crispy and golden brown and doesn't burn or stick to the pan it's made of avocado oil so it's basically just avocado oil okay, okay. So avocado oil Okay, fair enough. Vegan mayo is way less gross than actual mayo, if you think about it, because vegan mayo is made of avocado oil, and mayo is, I don't know, it's like hot dogs. I don't want to know what it's actually made of. But but yet delicious, and I love it in my tuna salad. But yes, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I knew, I knew. (laughs) You wouldn't know the difference, and I know because I secretly taste test vegan foods on my boyfriend to see if he'll notice that they're not actual foods, and he never notices the difference. Uh, I I confirm that we used to fan side used to be located by a, a place that had a great vegan grilled cheese, but that was straight delicious, uh, which, by the way, uh, since, you know, we've had a rabbi on the show today and we have a ketubah behind us, which is a marriage contract uh, for those he is who sitting right there. So yes. he can hear my whole side of the conversation. Well, so I, I do think that uh, in, in addition to a ballpark uh, near you should be. There should be a uh, a bagel schmear stand where you can like that. That I think would actually do incredibly well. Make it a reasonably priced thing. You can get a bagel, plain cream cheese, bang bang. Maybe have three three different options, and uh, you know it's a it's a nice little ditty. What a, a beautiful Sunday morning! You, you you get there, you have a bagel and cream cheese. You sit down and you have your hot dog in the fourth inning or whatever Gabrielle's going to have. I think that's a perfect day. You add in. The There's bagel never and cream a wrong cheese. time to eat a bagel and cream cheese. I right? think I actually tweeted that like two days ago because I had a bagel at 4 p.m. on President's Day after a hike. There's never a wrong time to eat a bagel and cream cheese. I bring bagels and cream cheese as my airplane food when I travel. Bert. Got any problem with bagels and cream cheeses being added to your ball, your ballpark stadium? No, actually, I don't. Like when I used to have dairy, strawberry cream cheese was my was my jam. I love that stuff. So just what about normal know. cream cheese? Wait, what's that? Yeah. What about same. normal cream cheese? No, no, <laughs> no, not at all. Normal cream cheese is a conspiracy, is what that is. That, that see, this is just <laughs> this is unfortunate. Um, How about blueberry I think we, cream cheese. Yeah, like I like regular cream cheese on the cinnamon raisin bagel. 
Ooh. It's very yeah, good. And, and, very and, good. Yeah, it, it is. And but like like you know, we're we, you're dealing with um, you know the heritage here, Bert. Egg bagel, uh, onion bagel, even a even a plain bagel. Everything bagel. Everything bagel is number one. I, I have another take. Yeah. Oh, no. An onion bagel is freaking delicious. I love hey, there you that. go. You're right about oh, that. Oh my God. We agree on a food take. This is a big day for Bert. Uh, if, if I was tweeting this, that would deserve the all caps breaking. Yeah. So there, yeah, that, that's big news. There's nothing wrong with a good onion bagel. Absolutely. Uh, all right, team. Gabrielle, thanks so much for being here. Uh, we look forward to, uh, you know, actual real baseball talk. Do you, uh, Bert wanted to get an opinion, by the way, on your uh, where you think Kyle Schwarber is going to land on our way out here. What do you think, Schwarbs? Um, I mean, look, I brought up the luxury tax thing, and I think that's one of the biggest things holding the Phillies back. If they sign him, they will have about ten million dollars under the cap, the, the cap, the threshold. If they decide not to exceed the threshold, which they've never done before. But I will say my theory that I was explaining to Bert the other day over text about the Phillies is that if the season is delayed, which it doesn't seem like it's going to be, but if it had been before the latest news about it, probably resolving next week, my theory was that the longer it stretched on, the less likely the Phillies were to do anything big when it ended because they have a ton of players coming off of the payroll at the end of the year, Aaron Nola, Zach Eflin, um, Kyle Gibson, like half their rotation, they are going to be doing a lot of not rebuilding, but just upgrading changes next off season. And I think that if the season had been delayed or if it is delayed, then they won't be as motivated to go for anything this year. And they will use this year as a bridge year to wait for so much money to come off of their payroll. I hope they sign Schwarber or I hope the Red Sox sign Schwarber. Um, but I don't know. I mean, they keep saying that they're willing to spend, but the current outfield is Bryce Harper and Matt Veerling and literally nobody else. So we'll see. Uh, Why I'm don't not, you give telling, Oh, I'm telling you, Carm, I'm still not going to discount the Phillies. I know how much they liked him before the lockout. I know how Dombrowski op- operates. Um, if they don't get him, Craig Kimbrell is going to be the name to watch, I think. Oh, God, no. Who's, who's the first guy that signs after the lockout? Oh boy, that's tough. Um, I won't give you a name because like that's gonna end up being really hard to predict, but I will give you this. For agency when it opens up is going to be absolute pandemonium. I've had agents, I've had executives, I've had basically everybody in baseball tell me that there's never been a period like this ever. Like as soon as the lockout's over, free agency is gonna start, rule five is gonna start. And salary arbitration is going to end up happening, um, but in terms of signings, I would—it's going to be madness. Just get ready. I'm, I'm already stocking up on coffee. If that's any indication. All right, Bert. I'm expecting a big performance for you. Uh, March second or third or fourth is basically what you said. Uh, that's my guess. Yeah, but get ready, Carm. We're, I'm not going to disappoint you. That's my one thing is I cannot disappoint Carm. All right. I like the, for the record, as we go out here, I like the momentum that is happening. I like their meeting every single day. I like, uh, uh, that, that there is actually some compromise that, that's a, a very, 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 very minor, but we are seeing it in print that the owners moved here. The players did this. We're probably going to have a report that things went really sideways coming up here and that it's never going to work. And then after that, it'll, they'll come back together and then we'll be done. And, 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 and baseball will be here. And we can all go pay overpriced. We can all go overpay for just bring beer prices down. How's this, how's that? I would love a nice, like a, a a good like half price beer day as a con. That's what that's what the owner should be thinking about. Things to give back to the fans once we mm. come back. How about that? Let's have a let's. Somebody should write that article. Maybe I'll do it. Mark, how much do you think you've spent on beer at ballparks in your life? Well. Um, you know, as a longtime vendor, Gabrielle, I, you know, I, I sold more than I've ever bought. Um, but let's, let's just like math that one out. Let's say for 20 years of drinking at ballparks going to say 
three game, uh, three drinking games a year. I'm not a normal, I don't drink every time I go. Let's say I, just, I drank three times of, of the year. So that would be 60, uh, I'm doing a terrible math here. I don't know, 10 grand? Does that sound about right? What? So what a minor leaguer makes in a season you've spent on, in your life on beer. I think that's park. too high or too low, Bert? Too high. <laughs> Uh, too high. Uh, I've never bought a beer at a ball game ever. I've never done it. So the weird food takes continue. You don't think oh, just in general how much concessions you spent? Uh, actually, yeah. Okay, I can see. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah. I, I mean, it's it's not it's not a hundred dollars. I'll say that. I maybe want to look too high, but uh, I don't know. It adds up, man. It's Especially good. now. It adds up. Uh, all right. Thanks for listening to Baseball Insiders. Click subscribe on that YouTube. Uh, and of course the audio version as well. And uh, Gabrielle's made me hungry throughout this whole podcast. Like I think she's got a, a vegan. Uh, I had coffee and then I had uh, this liquid gold juice from a place in Boston that I love. It looks delicious. Uh, I'm gonna so go have. Good. I'm gonna go have some vegan something right now just so I can feel healthy too. Bert, stay, stay, stay. Don't change, brother. Keep doing you, okay? Oh, damn straight. Yeah, count on it, Carm. All right, we'll be back next week. And for Bert to eat his fifth meal of the day. There we go. We'll see you next week. The Baseball Insiders with our fingers crossed that the lockout ends any moment. And, yes, uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.